Hey guys, and welcome back to Just Ask Jason, your bi-weekly-ish devotional here at Berean Christian Church. Uh, the last couple months have been weird for the Devo. We did a lot of reposts of previous teachings from our 21 Days of Prayer uh, event season, I guess, with City Hope Church. And then uh, it was kind of a regular from there where we started back in the two-week thing, then we kind of cut out. Uh, and that's just because of how crazy and weird my schedule has been recently between church stuff and school stuff and some other uh, ministry opportunities outside of the walls of Berean. Um, so I can't guarantee that this is going to be amazingly regular for the entire life of the devotional, but my intention is to continue with this and to aim for every two weeks. Maybe every, every once in a while it'll be every week for a little bit, or maybe you know we might miss a week here or there. But the goal is to give you some extra opportunities to learn in the church environment. Uh, so that's kind of what we want to do here with this devotional. Uh, today we're going to have not a super Bible heavy one, but one that I think is very important for Christians to kind of think through. And that is, uh, what do we do with all the scandals that happen in the church? Not Brian specifically, to my knowledge, there haven't been any scandals here. Um, but in the church universal, you know, across the United States, especially, it seems like every other week recently, there's been some sort of church scandal. If you don't run in like churchy circles very often, you may not have heard of all of them. I'm going to go through a few of them and just kind of give you a summary so you know where my headspace is at and then kind of talk through how I've been thinking through these uh, events and hopefully that will be helpful to you as well. So let's get into it. Now, we're going to get into some pretty heavy stuff here, so I just kind of want to give the disclaimer up front that we're going to be talking about, well, really heavy topics. We're going to be talking about church scandals, primarily scandals with uh, uh, sexual misconduct as a part of the issue, uh, also talking about people kind of abusing their financial situation a little bit, and that's not a huge part of the Devo, but I just want to give some context. Um, so some recent church scandals that you may or may not have heard of uh, over the last couple months, last couple of years. Uh, Canacook is a really, really big one. Camp Canacook or Canacook Camps, I'm not sure which way it's supposed to go, is a series of very popular, very large evangelical youth camps uh, operated by a rich evangelical personality. The camps have a really well-documented history, actually going back decades, of campers being abused, including being sexually abused, especially by one particular individual that was very involved in the camps for a long period of time. Uh, you can just Google Canacook Camps Abuse, and you'll find entire websites devoted um, to kind of exposing what happened. Facts about Canacook is a big one. The Julie Roy's report may or may not have reported on it. I can't remember off the top of my head, but she might have. Um, but there's a lot of documentation about what's been going on there. And they've denied everything. They've hit survivors with NDAs. Um, it's just a really sad situation. Another situation that's really sad and multifaceted is John MacArthur. Just in general, all the things around him. Uh, it's been my opinion for a long time that John MacArthur is a rather impetuant individual. Um, He's just a difficult person to deal with, seemingly. Uh, I don't have any personal relationship with him, but he kind of broadcasts this air of being a, uh, a fiery gospel and gospel-only preacher, but he kind of takes that too far and to the point where he is verbally abusive towards his opponents, uh, where he talks down to those that he disagrees with, and it's just not something that I personally enjoy or think is befitting of a pastor. Um, but I could kind of deal with it. Okay, he's difficult, he's a little obnoxious, but whatever. Um, there's been accusations, pretty well-founded accusations of abuse in the seminary that he started called the Master's Seminary. Um, again, you can just go look that up and find all the dirty details if you want to. And in my opinion, more disturbingly, uh, there's a lot of evidence, including a letter written by John MacArthur himself and signed that is now publicly available um, that he wrote to an individual who was molested by her father while her father was on staff at John MacArthur's church. And MacArthur seems to acknowledge knowing that something had happened with the child and encourages her to kind of live and let live because he believes that Jesus is restoring that staff member. Uh, that staff member served for several more years on staff with John MacArthur, and he went on to another church and served there until he ended up uh, dying of cancer many years later. 
Uh, it was never brought to account for his actions. Uh, Robbie Zacharias is one that I've mentioned before, so I won't go too into detail. Here, he carried on numerous adulterous and abusive relationships with women around the U.S. and Canada, and probably in Southeast Asia too, but the uh, formal investigation didn't extend that far. Uh, it focused on the U.S. primarily, so uh, not sure that's conjecture, but it seems likely. Uh, he also used ministry funds as a tool to entice and manipulate some of those women. And quite recently, Liberty University is getting in some hot water too, uh, which it's familiar with being in hot water for a lot of reasons. But in this case, it's because uh, it's being accused of not handling sexual misconduct accusations well. Basically, when people claim that they've been sexually assaulted or even raped on campus, then Liberty did not always um, go through the proper channels. Uh, and didn't make sure that those victims were protected and that other potential victims were protected as they should have. So they're actually in a, in a lawsuit right now dealing with that sort of thing. And of course, then there's things that aren't scandals, but they're still really gross. Um, if you go on Instagram, you can look up two accounts, Preachers in, like the letter N, sneakers, or Prophets in, letter N, watches. So Preachers in sneakers, Prophets in watches. Super popular accounts, I follow both of them. And basically their entire thing is they just find pictures, videos, whatever, of famous preachers, and then they try to price out parts of their outfit. So Preachers and Sneakers especially tries to say, well, how much do their shoes cost? And Profits and Watches tries to tell you how much their watches cost. And like some of these guys are like rolling out on a Sunday, preaching to a crowd in outfits that literally cost more than the down payment on my house. Like it is absolutely insane the amount of money that some of these people are just wearing like casually like my outfit is a free shirt like a $20 pair of jeans some and one socks because it's a good brand and uh, some torn up Skechers tennis shoes because I'm working out later like that's my outfit the most expensive thing I'm wearing is my glasses. actually I guess technically it's my tattoo but the point being like there are some preachers out there rolling in money and that's gross, right? It's not necessarily a scandal, but like it's not befitting of a pastor and churches shouldn't want their pastors walking out on a Sunday wearing $10,000 worth of clothing, right? That's not befitting the station. It doesn't make the church look good. Like why do our pastors have so much money they can blow $10,000 on a, on a nice jacket and a pair of shoes and a pretty watch? That seems insane to me. Uh, and then kind of in the same vein of like abusing... Uh, abusing the church financially, abusing their followers financially, using money on things they shouldn't be using money on or getting money from things they shouldn't be getting money from. There's quite a large number of pastors, and I won't name names because it's just not necessary, uh, but there's quite a large number of pastors offering unaccredited training. Uh, and this is, a, this is normal, right? You can go online and find training for anything, but normally the courses are reasonable, right? $80, $100 for a good chunk of training. It's basically like buying a book. Essentially, it's just in video format or an audio format instead of being written. But there's a number of pastors out there uh, who are offering training in anything from how to preach to how to run a church to how to lead or whatever, ranging from $2,000 to $10,000. One particular example, again, I'm not going to name names, um, but one particular example that I found was $10,000 for a two-day retreat. $10,000 for two days. I paid $10,000 for a master's degree. What on earth are you doing in two days that's worth the same amount of money that my entire graduate, my entire accredited graduate degree is worth? That is completely bonkers to me. And it's a past, an active pastor in a large church who is offering this training. So in addition to whatever he's bringing in from the church, and I, I believe he has a few books out, so from his book sales and from the church and from his speaking engagements, because big pastors like that always have outside speaking engagements. Even small-time pastors like me can make a couple hundred bucks here and there from outside speaking engagements, like doing a camp or something like that. Um, but there, once you get to that level, people know you and they'll pay you a lot of money to come talk at their college or their camp or their whatever. So in addition to all that, he's making $10,000 a head uh, for a two-day retreat. That's insane. It's not a scandal, but it sure is gross. So what do we do with all these? Because like every single one of the things I listed, and I could name a dozen more and we could be here for an hour. What do we do with this? Because this just makes me feel disappointed in the church. It makes me feel angry at other pastors. Like what, what do we do with this information? I'm going to have two kind of 
responses. I want to talk to you about why I still believe in the church, and then I want to talk to you about kind of what I want to do, what I feel I've learned, what I want to change in my own life or maintain in my own life as a result of these scandals. And hopefully this kind of way that I've processed through this will help you process these sorts of things uh, that have happened in the past or ones that will continue to happen in the future. So why do I still believe in the church? Um, frankly, a lot of it is because of the people that I actually know in the church or people that I follow in the church. Uh, I have my ministry friends, people who are also vocational ministers who are in similar roles to me. Um, and seeing their work and their passion for the church and the way that they've sacrificed in order to love people well um, has been really inspirational to me. Uh, among these people are Martin. He's my best friend. He's one of my groomsmen. He's a youth pastor up in Iowa. Uh, Noah and Bryce, they're two of my buddies in town. They're senior ministers at other churches. We play really nice together. Our churches play really nice together. Uh, we meet up all the time and talk and kind of hang out and catch up with one another and just seeing how they love their congregations is really inspirational. Uh, also Brandy, uh, who actually we're hiring Brandy Miles, who will be our next next gen minister here at Berean. But right now she's serving as a teaching pastor at a church in Waverly, Missouri. And just talking to her and hearing some of the things that she's had to go through, but also how much she still loves her congregation, uh, despite the, the fact that ministry is hard. Uh, that is very impressive to me and inspirational to me. So having people like this in my life uh, really helped me see, okay, there are vocational ministers out there who are doing the right thing, who are serving well, who are loving their people. You know, not everyone is a Ravi Zacharias. Not everyone is a uh, Mark Driscoll. You know, there are people out there who are serving and loving the church well and are sacrificing for the sake of the church and for the sake of others. Uh, other people in the same kind of category that aren't vocational ministry involve, uh, like my elders, or include my elders, uh, Russ, Mike, Jim, Paul, and Chris. Those are all men of God who don't get paid a dime and still really sacrifice for our church. Our ministry leaders as well kind of fall in that category. Steph, Jera, Megan, Jared, uh, Allison, and Laura. All of them have given an amazing amount of time to Berea and just trying to love on people under their ministry umbrella. And Actually, everyone on that list steps outside of their ministry and serves in other areas as well, uh, and their spouses do as well. Uh, so that's just an amazing group of people there. Also, there's my mentors who have decades of experience serving and loving the church and the way that they've interacted with me as well. And they've been able, even though, you know, I don't pay any of them, they don't get anything out of it. Like, I'm not going to help them find a job. I'm not going to, like, take a bunch of work off their plate. I'm not going to, like pay them anything. Like I don't benefit them in any way, but they still find time to invest in me as a person just because they care. Uh, people like Jimmy, Step, Gary Johnson, Jason Posnick, and Brandon Bradley are really at the top of my list in that category. And then there's people that I don't actually have any personal relationship with, but I admire them from a distance. I see their public ministry and I'm just like that, that is a person who knows Jesus. And people that fall in this category for me are Shane Claiborne, who's just a really cool guy. Do I agree with him on everything? Absolutely not. But he just is someone who's so obviously shaped by his experiences with Jesus that it's amazing. Uh, Julie Royce is another person. She's an investigative reporter who really aims to uh, restore the church by revealing the places that the church has failed. And she's a devout Christian, seems to be an amazing person. She's doing really good work. N.T. Wright and Tim Mackey are also big influences in this area. People that just seem to be doing things the right way, handling fame the right way. Um, so I'm very impressed by those individuals. And of course, I could list more people in pretty much every single one of these categories. Uh, John 13, 35 kind of summarizes this part of the reason why I haven't given up on the church for me. Uh, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's Jesus's words to his followers. I think they still apply to us today. There are plenty of pastors and churches and organizations we can point to and be like, they aren't acting very Christian. We can find time. I gave a bunch of examples at the start of this Devo. But we can also find a lot of people that are really honoring and loving Jesus. And I stay in the church in large part because of those people. 
because of the people who love one another and in so doing they show the world that they are Jesus's followers. There are tons of people, I'm not saying everyone that gets caught up in a scandal doesn't really follow Jesus, but there's a lot of people we're going to see in high positions in the church who are wolves in sheep's clothing, who are in the highest levels of our organizations, but they don't really know Jesus. And you can tell because they have no ability to love others unless it benefits them. So all these people that I listed are people that love others even though it doesn't benefit them in any way. And their example, their example inspires me to stay in the church. It shows me that there's way more good people in the church than bad people. The bad people are just better at grabbing headlines. At any rate, it is true that many parts of evangelicalism especially, but the church in general, uh, our positions of power are generally filled, not maybe not generally, but are too frequently filled with people who are not spiritually prepared to be in those positions of power. They've not been discipled. They haven't been tested. They don't have the character necessary to live up to uh, the fame and the influence they get in that position without failing miserably. Uh, and we need to do a better job as the church, making sure our leaders are actually ready to be Jesus honoring leaders and not just promoting people because they're charismatic or they're exciting or they're successful or they have skills. It's better for your pastor to just be a loving person than be super skilled. It's better for your pastor to be like a massive Bible nerd than be super cool. Like we need to start learning these lessons or we're going to keep seeing failures like this at the highest level. Now, in addition to the people, I could point to things that churches do as organizations, like where the Samaritan's Purse comes in and does millions and millions of dollars of uh, relief work. Uh, I got to work with them a little bit when there was a tornado out in Kentucky, and they're a super cool organization. They're not perfect. There's some things that I wish they'd change, but they're good. They try. Um, I could point to all our, our local churches, us and FCC and, and CHC, and all the different churches in the area that just do work that I'm aware of. Uh, in the community to just care and love on people. I could point to uh, the local Catholic parish's new priest and how hard he's been pushing for us to try to offer as a community more resources to the homeless and to low-income people. And just, just seeing all these things that people do, that these organizations or that these churches are doing, these parachurch ministries are doing, that's inspirational to me as well. But uh, I'd like to actually move on and just talk about what these scandals teach me as a pastor. As I've been trying to think and process these scandals, what have I learned as a pastor and as a Christian that, um, that maybe will help me in the future? How can I learn from the failures of others in light of Scripture and actually become a better Jesus follower through all this, um, through all these scandals, through all this difficulty? Uh, the first thing that I learned is obviously I'd better watch how I behave, especially as a pastor. Uh, James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Um, and that's pretty cut and dry. Uh, many of these pastors, maybe they could have had similar failings in their own personal lives and we could have more grace for them if they were just someone who, you know, is, is a standard everyday Christian. But they're pastors, they're teachers, and so they need to be held to a higher standard. And when they mess up, I'm not saying a pastor can never be restored when they mess up, but there's way too many times that I've seen pastors that have cheated on their spouse and they take a six-week sabbatical and come right back, and it's like, whoa, what on earth? Or someone who's stolen from the church and they, they kind of disappear from church life for like, at least public church life for like a year, and then they pop up in another church and it's like, you stole a million dollars and then you got lucky to get out of the embezzlement charges and now you're just pastoring another church like a year late. Like, did you even have time to learn a lesson? You know, um, teachers are going to be judged more strictly. And this isn't even like just in this life, although I think it should apply in this life. The church should judge their teachers more strictly. But uh, in the next life as well, at the great white throne judgment, I think that God is going to hold teachers to a higher standard because we accepted responsibility, we accepted authority. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but man, he's going to hold us to a higher standard. So we'd better start doing that. So I better watch how I behave. I better live up to that standard. Not my own personal standard, but I better live up to God's standard to the best of my ability. Second of all, I've seen that I need a good group of level-headed and God-loving people to advise me. 
Um, there was a really big scandal years back that I, I mentioned his name earlier in the Devo, but I didn't actually explain it like at the beginning. Um, his name is Mark Driscoll, this pastor named Mark Driscoll. There's a big blow. If you look up Mars Hill Church in Seattle, uh, you can find tons of stuff on it. Christianity Today did a really awesome long-form podcast explaining it. And one of the big things I've seen in my reading and in my listening about what went wrong at Mars Hill and kind of the abusive environment that Mark Driscoll created is Mark was unwilling to submit himself to the authority of other people. He wouldn't surround himself with older and wiser Christians that would tell him when he was doing wrong. He wouldn't listen to his peers either. There's a famous or quasi-famous quote from him that came out in this documentary from Christianity Today where uh, somebody told him, like, Mark, you need some old wise men, like Christian men, to advise you. You need to learn to submit to someone. And he said, I don't care who you submit to. You need to submit to John Piper or to uh, uh, McDonald. I can't remember his first name from Harvest Bible Chapel, who has had his own problems since then, but at the time was still fairly respected. And the guy just said, you need to respect to someone. I don't care if it's one of those two guys or if it's someone else, but you need to submit to someone. And Mark's response was, I can't submit to them because my church is bigger than theirs, which is just the most arrogant and like wrong-headed thing a pastor could possibly say in a situation like that. It's just twisted and wrong. Um, I don't want to be Mark. I need a group of level-headed, mature, God-loving people to advise me. And luckily I have that in my elders and in my mentors and in my ministry leaders. My ministry leaders, I've told them, I tell them all the time, you get to tell me when I'm wrong about something. I want them to, I want them to argue with me. That's kind of why I joke is that uh, I want them to argue with me. I joke that one of my ministry leaders got her position because she likes arguing with me. Uh, and that's kind of partially true. I want people to disagree with me lovingly and to correct me. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. I think that same proverb applies to the church as well. Last of all, uh, from these scandals, I've learned repeatedly that people are going to disappoint me. I looked up to a lot of the people that I've seen go through scandals. I really looked up to Ravi Zacharias. I could not believe the things that were being reported about him when they first started coming out. In fact, I firmly believed that it was all fake, that it like wasn't true until there was an actual formal investigation and there was just undeniable evidence. And I mean, it, it was one of the most shocking uh, events of my recent walk with Jesus. It, it was very difficult for me. My wife can attest to that. Uh, it took a lot of processing to try to get through that. Um, and I could name a few others, people that I kind of looked up to, and then they just really disappointed me with their behavior. Uh, I don't want to mudsling. Some of these people are still in public ministries today, and they didn't necessarily break any laws. It's just some of their personal conduct I'm not a fan of. I don't think it's befitting of a pastor. And there's a number of people that I just had to stop listening to, had to stop following, and I found that quite difficult. Uh, people have disappointed me. But Jesus will not. That's the third lesson. People will disappoint me. Jesus will not. Jesus will deal with the evil and the righteous alike in turn for their actions on the day of judgment. Revelation 22 gives us a picture of this, starting in verse 12. Jesus says, look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates and into the city. Outside, though, are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, are sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone else who practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you, this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And that picture here is a picture of, of judgment. It's a picture of there will be a place for the righteous where they will exist eternally with their father, with their creator. They will live side by side with Jesus, see him face to face. And there are, there's a place outside of that city, outside of this paradise, outside of this new heavens and new earth, where those who never truly followed will be. In this passage, they're called dogs. And they're described as those who are sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and people who practice falsehood. Um, so I trust that one day Jesus will judge. And he'll see the pastors that tried to serve him and just messed up. And he'll see the pastors that were just evil people that manipulated the church for their own benefit. And he will 
separate them. The sheep from the goats is one way that Jesus describes it in his earthly ministry. Um, and I believe in that. And because I believe in that, I can keep walking with the church knowing there's thousands upon thousands of good Jesus-loving pastors that are going to mess up, but they're going to try. And for those pastors that are evil, immoral, that are full of falsehoods, God's going to deal with them. And yeah, in the meantime, we should try to as well. We should try to get those people out of public ministries. We should try to force these people to repent. And if they won't treat them as a tax collector or a sinner, that's another one of Jesus' teachings in the book of Matthew. But regardless, the people that we miss, the people that have a following, no matter how egregious their behavior is, God will deal with them. Thank you guys so much for kind of walking with me through this. I hope it was helpful to somebody out there. I kind of make these devotionals hoping sooner or later someone will happen across one and it's really going to actually help out. Uh, if I'm not as energetic as usual, it's because I'm not. I'm still very much recovering from my last week of my MA. Last week, just mentally, I'm not all there right now. But I hope within the next few weeks, I'll be kind of back up. Uh, I'm also hoping to do a few more like theological deep dive study type things in this format. Uh, remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. It helps teaching like this get to other people like you. And uh, if you have any questions that you want me to answer, send them to me. If you know me personally, just text me and say, hey, can you do a Devo on whatever? Um, or send an email to the church. If you don't know me, you can look us up, bereanconnect.com, B-E-R-E-A-N, and then connect, C-O-N-N-E-C-T.com. And you can find our email there and blast that to us. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, which you are because it's the only place this Devo goes, you can literally just comment in the comment section. I check the comments really regularly. We don't get that very, very many, so it's easy to, to see. You can just drop a, a question in the comment say, hey, can you do a Devo on this? And I probably will, or at least I'll reply to your comment and try to give you a halfway satisfactory answer. So love you guys, praying for you. We hope to see you this Sunday if you're in the Murfreesboro area. And if not, you can join us online, of course. And uh, yeah, we'll get another Devo up in about two weeks. Bye now.